I'm here with legendary newscaster, journalist, Dan Rather. You need no introduction. You've Thank won you. every major award. But we're just having a backstage conversation before we're on stage here at BEA to talk about your new book, Rather Unspoken, which is a riveting tale of your life and all of the things Thank that have happened. It's, it's quite fascinating. But as you look back and look at 44 years CBS News, uh, 24 in the anchor chair, since then you've been continuing your work as a journalist. What story throughout all that book, what story had the biggest mark on you? I'm going to try to answer that question, but understand I've been so lucky and blessed as a reporter to live my dream, my childhood dream. It's always hard to center on one story because I've been lucky to be on a lot of big stories. Uh, but if I had to pick one, it would be the day-to-day, week-in, week-out coverage of Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. It was my, literally my first assignment at CBS News, which I did for about two years. It changed me as a person and it changed me as a pro. Well, you certainly have seen events and leaders in uh, politics, in government, in corporate America, everyday leaders. Just what, what would you say characteristics of a leader? When you think of a leader, because you talk about people who are not leaders and kind of examples of leaders, just stepping back and looking at it, who would you say, you know, th these are the qualities of a leader from Dan Rather? Well, the first is character. Character is all in a leader because it's true, the old cliche, that organizations and institutions, groups, right down to a military uh, squad, they take on the character and uh, the ways of the top leadership. I would say character is number one. Number two, not all, but most great leaders are very good listeners. It's one thing to hear, it's another thing to listen, to really absorb. Lyndon Johnson, for example, he could be a bombastic speaker, both publicly and in private, but he was a very good listener. Number three, they study people, which is of course related to number two, listening well. But great leaders, they know their people, if they're a national leader or a corporate leader or a union leader. They know their people collectively and they study people individually. Most good leaders handpick people closest around them. There are exceptions to that. But I'd say those are some of the characteristics. Well, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I, I'm also curious because most leaders or people that are successful have enormous personal drive. Yes. And you, after the story career, you could say, at my age, with all I've done, I won all the awards, I'm done. But you seem to have this enormous personal drive. You have this new... Um, venture going with Mark Cuban and you're doing some of the best reporting you've, you've done ever, kind of have the freedom to, to do what you'd sure. like. Uh, what keeps you motivated to keep going year after year looking for the next story? The driving dream. I've had it since I was a young child. I wanted to be a reporter. Yes, I dreamed of being a great reporter. I'm not there yet. But it's always been that driving dream. I was lucky that I knew early, from very early childhood, that I wanted to be a reporter. I didn't dream of being on television because television, while it had been invented, it wasn't around. Uh, but I, I've always had a passion for covering the news. I love to cover the news. And that passion, not only has it never waned inside me, but I think I burn with a harder, hotter flame now than perhaps I ever did, which surprises me a little. I thought by this time I'll be 81 in October, that it might begin to wane some. But uh, I love what I'm doing at HDNet, our Cuban's uh, cable and satellite channel because I have total, complete, absolute creative and editorial control. This is unusual in journalism. I think it's unique in modern journalism. I don't know of any other that's like that. So I get to do what I, I love to do best, which is deep digging investigative reports, international reporting and politics. Well, also you've had this long successful marriage with your, with your wife. You, 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 I, I love some of the things you say <laughs> when you first met her, but you also, moved all around the world, uh, either physically moving or chasing stories. You, you were gone a lot, but you seem to balance life, family life with work incredibly well. And that's a, a big thing that today people are looking to make sure that they balance that. I know Robin, for instance, you said, was in three different first grades. H how do you feel about uh, work-life balance and how did you maintain that and have such a successful marriage? Well, a successful marriage, and Jean and I have been married for 55 years and we know each other for 57 years. 
and you know nobody gets through marriage unscathed. We've had our ups and downs and our good moments and bad moments. And what I worried about the most when I was on the road and traveling a lot, I spent almost a year in Vietnam, late '65 to '66. And you didn't think you were going to be there a year when no, you left. No, I went think I'd be there two or three months, but the war was exploding right in front of the greatest story in the world. You don't walk away from a story like that. But most of the credit, we have two children, I have two children, and th thank me to Gene and God, they turned out very well. But I, I, that's center on the word balance. I think there's a misunderstanding about balance, that if you are striving to live your dream, your life is not going to be in balance. There's no way to put it in balance. You have choices to make. Uh, I go to Vietnam. It's going to be a dangerous assignment. I'm over-dramatizing. The danger to correspondence was not nearly what it was for people in uniform, but there was danger. And I had two young children. And the choice is to go or not go. And then there wasn't any doubt that I would go, and there wasn't any doubt in Gene's mind. But the idea that you can strike an even balance between family and your personal life and with your professional life, there may be some people who can do it, but I prefer to think in terms of choices, to make choices. Now, for example, I tried very hard when I was home, and there was a period, the Vietnam period, we went when I wasn't home very often. But when I was home, I tried to make the time count for Gene and the kids. I, I like that about choices. Uh, I'm going to take you all the way back to your childhood, where right. you didn't have a choice. Right. You got rheumatic, rheumatic fever, and you got it twice. So take right. an outdoor kid, and you were bedridden. And yet it seems to me that that ended up being a huge benefit to you in some ways because you were listening to the radio. It, it's amazing that e even how everything shapes you. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. I didn't think so at the time. I was a child, um, late 10, 11 years old, 11, 12, 13, when rheumatic fever hit me twice and I was bedridden. There was no known cure for it. And I can't say I was depressed, but I certainly was low. And for a long time, I thought it was a minus, but I came to believe that it was a plus, partly for the reason you mentioned. But the big thing that it gave me was persistence, uh, that I realized that I was going to be coming from behind in school because I'd missed a lot of school. Yes, I was homeschooled, as they call it now, studied at home for a long time, but I was behind in school. I was behind in athletics, being a Texan. Yes, I wanted to be a football hero, wanted to start on my high school team. I felt I was behind for a long time. But somehow, it welled up inside of me and this, well look, you have a choice here, the proverbial fight or flight. So fight, fight for your dream. And I realized that I never was going to be the smartest person in the room or the smartest person in the story. But I could be, no, take the attitude, nobody's going to outwork me and I'm not going to give up. Well, you don't give up, nobody does outwork you and uh, you do have that fight in you. I'm just, I just want to end with this and then on stage we'll talk about all your different stories and presidents and all of those things, but you're rather uh, critical of some of the current state of journalism saying it's, uh, you sum it up as the corporatization, politici politicization, trivialization of the news. Right. Trivialization, I can't yeah. even pronounce that. And you know, can, can reporters today, I mean, you look back at all the questions that you asked, you're known for asking these tough questions. Can reporters today even ask those questions? They can, and some of them do. But I've said, and I include myself in this criticism, I do not accept myself as criticism. In American journalism, uh, in some ways, we've lost our guts, we've lost our grit. We, I've said we need a spine transplant. Because the current situation, particularly with the corporatization and politicalization and trivialization of the news, has created for most journalists, not all but most journalists, tremendous pressure from the top don't ask the tough question. Don't get involved in controversy. Cover things that are not going to be controversial. Or if you cover a controversial story, move in the middle, move the mass. Don't get out front on the story. Because if you do, number one, with the closeness of big corporate money, with big government in Washington, whether it be Republican or Democrat, there's going to be pressure from above. Uh, they don't like it. They don't like trouble. The other thing is, if you handle controversial stories, if you face the furnace, you're going to have to take the heat. Somebody's going to put a sign around you, a derogatory name, they're going to call you a communist or a socialist or unpatriotic or you don't support the troops. And that leads to a big undertow of fear. Journalists don't like to talk conquer fear, including this one. We like to see ourselves as fearless. But there's a certain amount of fear in almost every journalist now and in every newsroom. 
you ask a tough question, you pose controversy, you might lose your job. Price to pay. It's right. a tough job market out there. All those things have created this under control. I do see some signs that things are improving a bit. I'm an optimist by nature and by experience. And American journalism remains the best, most quality and integrity field journalism in the world. But we need to get back to that period, which has not been that long ago, when the owners of the largest national distribution systems back their journalists and see journalism as a public trust and therefore to be operated at least some of the time in the public interest. Well, your book is, is a terrific perspective. It, it you. gives you a, a really view through modern history. I mean, kids today should read a, a view of it. And whether people agree with it or disagree with it, it's a strong perspective. It is um, an excellent example of all of those things from leadership to all the current events and, mm -hmm. and really a, a great perspective from someone who was actually there. So I'm so happy to Thank talk you very with you much. and I best of luck with the book. Thanks so much. Talk on stage. We'll talk on stage.